Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Uh, we have a very special guest, Jim Mises. He's joining us. Um, Jim was former CEO of Blaze Pizza, former president of Freebirds, um, led innovative operations and global development at Starbucks, uh, tons more, which we'll talk about. But that's just a brief info about Jim. Um, and I think what he's going to share today will be super valuable to all of you. So, um, Jim, do you want to maybe share your screen and get started on your presentation? And hello, everybody. And I really hope that we, my presentation will be short so we can spend more time answering questions. Um, a little bit that I think is important for you to understand before I actually go to the screen, and that is um, I'm, I'm in my mid 60s, and I've discovered that you know the first 30 years are about learning. So, you guys are all in the learning phase. The next 30 years are about earning right? Uh, it's all about making a living in your family and things that come about later on. And the last 30 years, I hope I get three laps of 30, by the way, that's my goal, three laps of 30 around the block. And then that last uh, 30 years is all about returning, meaning giving back and paying it forward. So I'm excited to spend time with you all learning, earning and returning. So let me go to uh, share my screen. Just a little bit about myself. I'm, a, I'm not from San Luis Obispo. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, uh, I, I share this piece that, you know, I, I played college football at Dartmouth and I was uh, first team on Metro because I want to share football taught me an awful lot about business and about leading others. And I'll get to that in a second. Lucky enough to uh, go to school at Dartmouth College and I actually was classmates with a guy by the name of Jeff Immelt, who was the CEO of General Electric and we still stay friends today. Jeff, a uh, great story just to real briefly was actually became the CEO on September 10th, 2001. And you all know what happened the next day, right? September 11th. Um, so he was the CEO of the largest uh, manufacturing company in the, in the world and uh, had quite a run after that. But anyway, um, I went to UCLA for my master's in accounting and finance and ended up in the world of operations. And I'll share a little bit about that as well. Um, if you had to describe who I am, it's affinity for numbers because I believe that you have to measure what matters. It's all about people and you better extend your heart before you offer your hand. So um, we're gonna learn a little bit about me and how I think about things. Um, but let me go back to uh, what football taught me. So I'm an offensive lineman and I, I dare anyone, any one of you to tell me who was on the offensive line of the world champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers this year. <laughs> Nobody can tell you, right, uh, exactly right. But Tampa Bay won because they had the best quarterback and they had some receivers and they played some good defense, right? But um, if you look at any great team, it's the offensive line that determines the success of the offense, no doubt about it, right? And what I learned is that serving others, which is what an offensive lineman does, enables the team to be successful. And at any point in time, if the offensive line wants to do what's called a lookout block, which is say look out as the defensive line runs by you, <laughs> the quarterback and the running backs are going to go nowhere, right? So I share that because um, I've always believed you lead quietly, you lead unassumingly, you lead by serving others, and in the restaurant business, that's clearly the case. And we'll talk about that as well in a minute. Um, so as I said before, my background was accounting and finance. I majored in that, and then I went to work in the typical accounting finance functions of a um, hundred different subsidiary conglomerate way back in the early eighties, that would be Greyhound Armor Dial. Um, then I went to work for Hunt Lesson, some time at, at Denny's and Winchell's. And seriously, as a 26 year old, my, the CFO of Denny's and Winchell's came to me. I was the director of finance and said, you need to be, you need to do the accounting role for a couple of years. Um, because if you want to be the CFO, which is not the case today, but back then, if you want to be the CFO, you better go take two years of accounting and, and be the controller. And I said, I hate looking back. I only like looking forward and um, I really don't like accounting. And he said, well, then you, you don't, what you don't want to be is a 40 year old director of financial planning. So at the ripe age of 26, um, after having spent a lot of money to get my undergrad and my graduate degree, I think you'll appreciate this. I went home to my wife and said, well, they'll, they'll pay for me to learn how to be a GM, a general manager of a restaurant, if we want to go do that. And I went and said to my parents as well, you know, um, all that great education you gave me, I'm gonna go turn it in and learn how to run a restaurant. 
Um, my father, who uh, was an entrepreneur, said, that's a great idea. My mother, who was a teacher, said, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> my wife said, I guess I'll support you, um, but uh, good luck. And um, uh, honestly, it was the best decision I ever made because I, I learned how to apply my people skills and my leadership from things in football and I had to learn how to go run a restaurant. So I actually was a restaurant general manager, learned how to run a restaurant. Thank goodness I had a great district manager who taught me all the ins and outs and, and, and I had to learn how to be good at it. Um, and then I moved up in the ranks and, and the rest of that is history. Um, I was lucky enough to be recruited by Taco Bell and learned how um, to, and I had to go prove myself all over again, starting out as a general manager at a Taco Bell, district manager, area manager, franchise business manager, but all that helped me to um, learn how to lead people and how to be good at what you do, which is as you move forward in your career, you know, you have to be grounded in what you're doing. And only as you get up in the, in the organization, do your general skills make a difference. So I was very grateful and lucky to be able to learn how to actually run a restaurant. Um, I don't think any, well, yeah, you're all too young. In um, 1990, um, I uh, went to the CEO of, of Taco Bell and said, you know, I think we're, we're marketing Taco Bell all the wrong way. We need to be a value brand and we need to put everything into 59, 79 and 99 cents and have a, what we call the value menu. And so um, we, uh, <laughs> I changed the face of Taco Bell and changed the face really of the fast food industry way back in 1989 by um, going on air with just marketing that said 59, 79, 99 run for the border. And all of our products were either listed as 59 cent products, 79 or 99 cent. And ladies and gentlemen, our sales went from 600,000 a year to 1 million the next day. All right. So we went from an average of 12,000 a week to 20,000 a week overnight. We took share from McDonald's. We took share from Burger King. And the launch of now what you see every day now, everyday value menu, whether it's the dollar breakfast meals or buy one, get one free or buy one, get one for a dollar that you now see in fast food was all a result of what happened at Taco Bell way back in 1989. But the reality is um, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I'm not the creator. Um, and that this is an entrepreneur's group. If you're the creators, God bless you. We need you. Um, but I want you to know that if you're going to be the creator and entrepreneur, you're going to need a guy like or a gal like me in the future. All right. Uh, Steve Jobs had it at Apple. Gates had it at, my, at, uh, at Microsoft. You have to have the guy who puts into place the execution of, your, of the vision of the founder. So while I'm not the creative force behind Blaze or Noah's Bagels or Jamba Juice or Evolution Fresh Juice that Starbucks created. I'm the guy who made it all happen for those founders. And um, we'll talk about what a first follower needs and how you scale a great brand. All right, um, I thought I would spend a little bit of time talking about lessons learned. And I wanna reassure you since you're all um, 22 years of age or younger, it's okay right now to not know what your career path is, all right? I had no idea at your age that um, I would have the kind of success I've had. Uh, I, I knew I was good with people. I knew I was very good with numbers, but I had no idea I was going to the restaurant business when I was an undergrad. That's for sure. It was not even on my radar. Um, but what I did have is a father who said all the time, follow your passions. If someone will pay you to do what you love, then it's a blessing, right? Um, and my father used to say to me, if you get paid for doing something you love, <laughs> you know, you're never going to work. You're just going to do what you love. And so I would encourage you to think about your passions. And I have some questions at the end that'll help you with identifying what's your zone of genius and how do you pursue those passions, right? Um, surround yourself with people who are smarter than you and let them fly and enable everyone to perform their best in their zone of genius. This is a true story. In 1990, when I was a regional VP at PepsiCo, which was part of Taco, Taco Bell's part of it, I actually fought with the CEO because he wanted to understand everybody's weakness. And I said to him, I don't understand that. Everyone, if you play everyone's strength, then you'll have the best team possible. And I used the analogy to him back then. You know, if your shortstop goes down with an injury on a baseball team, you don't move the third baseman, the shortstop, the second baseman to third base and the first baseman to another position, right? That's, that's the worst thing you could possibly do. Go replace the shortstop at the best shortstop you have and leave everybody at the place they do best. 
And that was one of the lessons um, I learned very early and realized again that <laughs> if everybody's doing what they love, then your team will be great and your organization will be great. And trying to fill everybody's weaknesses is a horrible thing to do. You know, I'm a, I'm a horrible artist. If you asked me to go paint every day, I would be miserable. All right. And I think if you ask uh, anybody on, in this room today, I want you to I want you to work on your weaknesses. Unless that's something you really want to do, that's a horrible way to spend time if you don't enjoy it. Um, early on, the only constant in business and life has changed. Lord knows the last year and a half has taught us that. So love it or lead it and don't fight it. Um, I think that's really important to think about um, how you adapt and how you create the resilience that's going to define who you are. Innovate, be a calculated risk taker and follow your passion. Again, over and over, I come back to following your passion is the key, I think, to life um, and the key to you as you discover who you are. Um, be true to yourself. Listen to your heart and your head and follow your beliefs, your values, and your sense of right and wrong. They'll never, take, never lead you in the wrong sense. It may get Liz Cheney, but it's not, still she's got to stand up for what she knows is right versus what's going on today um, in, in politics. And play your strengths. As I said before, when you operate in your zone of genius, you will be at your best. So, so true. And um, I'm sure all of you are in this Entrepreneurs Association because at least at this point, you believe that's your zone of genius and when you're at your best creating versus doing something that someone else just wants you to do. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Blaze because I think it's important to understand how Blaze came to be. As I said, the, the, I, I'm not the founder, that's Rick and Elise Wetzel, right? But I'm one of their first hires to help them scale. And I think the thing that you have to understand about Blaze is look at all the players that were on the field when Blaze came on. Uh, the world did not need another pizza shop. It already had Domino's, it had Round Table, it had Pizza Hut, Little Caesars, et cetera, Papa John's. The world didn't need another pizza player, but it really did. Because what Blaze did was fill a niche that wasn't there. And that is pizza for lunch. Down the line, all for one price, no nickel and diming you as you added things um, on your pizza. And if you think about it, you've had burritos went uh, fast casual for lunch. You had salad for lunch, burgers for lunch, um, uh, Asian food for lunch, all right? Um, but nobody had taken pizza for lunch. I'd argue that um, other than large pizzas, Nobody had pizza for lunch. Nobody went to a Pizza Hut or a Domino's for lunch for yourself. But what Blaze did was break the mold and say, ah, we can enter the $45 billion segment because we're going to offer a great value and, and variety all at one price at lunch. And you can have it for dinner too. And that's how Blaze was created. It was really looking at where was the opening in the category. All right. Um, we grew really fast. We grew really, really fast through franchisees. I love to tell the story that, you know, Blaze and Mod, I'm sure you're, um, you're familiar with Mod, which is all company on just about. Blaze was built on less than $5 million of capital. Mod was built on $350 million of capital. So the founders of <laughs> Mod have a lot more um, uh, uh, dilution of their investment than the founders of Blaze ever had because we grew with franchisee money because we would let them license the brand. So as you can see, 98% franchised, 40 states in Canada and the UAE in just seven years, 340 restaurants and great cash on cash returns. In the restaurant business, you're looking at 30% or more. Um, and that's what, how people will invest. What do we do? We had to create some tenants for the brand, right? It's a modern pizza brand that was targeting millennials and Gen Z. Uh, we weren't targeting the folks who were just looking for a, you know, $5.99 two topping pizza that you can get at Domino's. By the way, that's nothing wrong with that. You need it as a college student or if you're a family with two or three kids, it's a great inexpensive way to feed the family, but that's not who, that's not where we were targeted. All right, it was founded on fresh dough. I'm just gonna stay here. It'll be easier to follow this way. Um, and I'm not sure today if that's really important, all right? But it was to the founders in the beginning that our dough was made fresh in house. Mod today likes to talk about um, that they're, <laughs> they're fresh pressed every day. Um, and I don't know if uh, people go to Blaze because they think the dough is made in house fresh every day. Um, round table pizza is made fresh, but everyone else is frozen dough. And I'm not sure the guests would tell you that that's a value add. So, but that was important to us um, in the beginning. 
Um, we were cooked with fire uh, and that was really important. And so we didn't use a conveyor oven like you see for others. We actually had a real deck oven with a gas burning stove at you know, roughly 800 degrees and everything was, uh, was all natural. No artificial colors, flavors or preservatives. We thought that was important. And of course we had gluten-free options and uh, now today keto options, everything. We wanted to keep it real. We wanted to throw, we were targeting millennials but we wanted to throw a wide net in terms of, you know, it could feed families, it could feed children, certainly with a cheese pizza, we could feed uh, seniors um, because it was good for you food, um, as best pizza can be. Um, and, you know, again, we wanted to keep it real. The last thing we felt was really important was both our marketing with that man, LeBron, um, that I'm sure you've all seen the video when, when Ron is in the back of the restaurant. Uh, can you raise your hand if you've seen that video before? Ron as a employee? No, a couple people have. Huh, Would, should, we, should, we, should we show that? We can show that, Lane, if we want to take three minutes of the video. It's the coolest video around. This is so much fun. Sauce gonna get you, Dave. Thank you. Let's go on in, Ryan. Spicy red, you got it, sir. Oh. Millions and millions of views. Everything all right? All right. There goes going around. Ron, going great. Going great. How's your first day going, man? It feels great. Let Fernando know about our sauces. Uh, Remember the we training? got spicy sauce, we got, we got regular sauce, we got pesto sauce. sauce. We got yep. We got a little great. white sauce here. So, I mean, I love spicy sauce, but you're not might not be a spicy guy. So, spicy man. For a name like Fernando, <laughs> got to be spicy. Whole variety of sauces. Run, run. We got to run and run. We got to run. Oh, what's the run and run? We got to run and run. How you going, Ron? I'm Ron. Uh, nice to meet you. Ron, all right. Some Michigan t-shirt there. Huh? Yeah, Michigan. I was yeah. talking to him about Michigan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You like Michigan? There's nothing wrong with Michigan. I, don't know. I was born in Michigan. Someone's on yes. the phone? Uh, yeah, it's my grandma. Yeah, tell grandma. grandma. What's your hey, grandma. Tell her, say, say Ron and Eric says hello. Hey, Ron. Hello, what's how up? are you? How are you? I love your glasses. Thank you. You're so awesome. You look very familiar. Very familiar. She's first day on the job. Yeah, I'm learning. I'm shadowing. Yeah. Really That's tall shadow. Awesome. He looks like Dwayne. Uh, Dwayne Wade? Wade? I get that a lot. I get that a lot. Yeah, I've heard of that guy too. You know, yeah. What is that on, on your chest? Is that a, a is that a golf ball? No, it's basketball. Oh, that's a basketball. Yeah, yeah. That, this, this. That's basketball, man. I keep telling him he's gotta try basketball. No, I don't, I don't know that. <laughs> is that when the referee holds up the to the goalpost? That's, that's football. That's football. I am uh, headed to my uh, next job. Um, yeah. So okay. You can take over from now. Okay. You got it. Hey, B, enjoy your pie, man. Thank you. All right. Selfie with Ron. Selfie time with Ron. Great place to come for your lunch break. All right. You all see that? Yeah, that was a great idea. Jim, how'd you guys get uh, LeBron? Oh, hello, hello, hello. Oh, oh, I gotta stop this. Shoot. Sorry, Jet. Sorry, everybody. All right. Hey, what's going on, man? How you doing? All right, I'm Ron. Oh, what's going on? How you doing, sir? Uh, How you doing? I'm Ron. Hey, what's going on, man? How you doing? Let me get out of that. There we go. That's, this is our new commercial. Hello, hi. How are you? How you doing? Pause button, Jim. All right. Sorry about that, everybody. Um. So just let me get to a couple other things. So how did we how did we meet LeBron? Well, the story is pretty straightforward. Um, he was interested in being a franchisee, and we wouldn't let him be a franchisee <laughs> because he doesn't have any operating experience. But he did have a lot of money, and he, we knew he could help us build the brand. So we put him into uh, connections with a franchisee who wanted to franchise Miami, where LeBron was playing at the time when he was still down in Miami. And um, they be, he became a franchisee. And when he became a franchisee, he asked if he could invest in the corporate environment as well. And we said, absolutely. And so we struck a deal with LeBron that he would do some uh, uh, you know, Twitter posts, uh, that he would do a couple, uh, do a couple 
commercials. This really wasn't a commercial. It was a, you know, it was a viral uh, feed, um, a viral video that we, that we sent out. And um, we didn't want to use them as a spokesperson in terms of a, a commercial. We thought that wasn't right for the Blaze as the brand. But um, he worked out very well. He got a, obviously got a piece of ownership of the company. And in 2017, we sold a piece of the company and LeBron made a good amount of money and he's still an investor today. So that's how that goes. All right, let me uh, share the screen again. Get back to, there we go. Um, so, the, you know, LeBron was important to the growth of the brand, as was, you know, our social digital platform and ultimately getting on board with an app and the website. And we talked earlier, Kaylin, about Hathaway being our, our app provider and our um, web designer that really helped us move forward. All right, so I want to spend a few minutes and I'm open up for questions is really, you know, here you are um, somewhere between freshmen and seniors in school and college. And I'd ask you, have you thought about times of what is your brand? How do you differentiate yourself? And what makes you special and unique? Yeah, I'm not asking you to answer those questions uh, publicly today, but I'd ask you to think about those questions over your next couple of years because, um, one of these days you're gonna go out into the marketplace and I think answering those questions is gonna be critical to the job you seek and the acceptance of an offer from someone who sees you as fitting in and working with uh, that company and how they see that you can make a difference for them. But I do have some questions that can help you answer those questions in terms of who are you. So um, what is currently going well for you? What do you find that's meaningful, enjoyable and fun? And on the flip side, what do you hate to do? What, what drains you, makes you stressed or makes you feel that you're wasting your time, all right? Those are those weaknesses and things that really um, you wanna try and avoid. And, and when you're working with other people, perhaps on some school projects even, you wanna find people who can compliment you, your weaknesses with, and your strengths complement their weaknesses so that you guys, everyone together works really well. What skills do you have that really you really enjoy and love to use? And let me be clear about something. There's a difference between zone of competence and zone of genius. And I'll start with an example for myself, all right? I'm a math whiz. It's my zone of competence, all right? I can work numbers, I think, uh, and understand anything associated with business numerically as good or better than anyone. It's not what I love to do. It's not my zone of genius. I think my zone of genius is actually inspiring others to greatness. But my ability to move up in the organization early in life was all about my zone of competence, which was really being a financial analyst, all right, and doing financial planning, but not my zone of genius. And so um, both of those are really important to leverage earlier in your career, but to be at your very best, it's being in your zone of genius versus your zone of competence. And by the way, even today, I still spend time in both, but I do all I can to stay away from the areas that I don't like to do, right? Um, how do you know what's the difference? Because I think when you're in your zone of genius, time flies. You know, you've all had those days where you're doing something and you go, I can't believe the whole day went by. What happened to it? Versus in your zone of confidence, it'll still go by fast, but you might be a little drained or you won't be as jazzed or as excited as when you're in your zone of genius. Genius. You might ask yourself, what are your three top core values that can help you find your zone of genius? And then ask yourself, what would your ideal day look like? Describe it in vivid detail from morning until bedtime and you'll start to understand your zone of genius. And I think that's really important. And what I wanna leave you with in terms of opening up for questions, in terms of over your next couple of years, how do you really get to know who you are and then emphasize the things that are, that are important to you, that are your values and that are things you love to do. And with that, um, Lane and Team, I'll turn it back to you for questions and anything you want to go after. Love it. Thank you, Jim. I really enjoyed that. Um, you got a couple questions in the chat. Joe, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, uh, I was uh, wondering, but yeah, that slide that showed uh, all the franchisees and how you guys scaled up so quickly. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and, you know, how you find those franchisees and, like, you know, I don't know how, how you make that connection. Great question. Um, I think we were really lucky because we started out, we opened up two company restaurants and they were really, really successful. 
So what that enabled us to do is broadcast that success. Um, and the key, you're going to laugh at this. Um, I think running restaurants <laughs> is a lot like uh, ants following the leader. And so um, we, we strategically sourced a couple of really good franchisees who we knew if we could get them, that others would follow. And so we reached out to a couple of folks we knew who had franchised other uh, concepts that were really good. We shared with them our success and had them come on out and take a look at it. And uh, once we got one or two leaders on board, honest to goodness, it went really quickly. Um, we were very lucky. We were lucky that we had great unit level economics that we could share with them. We were lucky that LeBron signed on very early and that made it um, uh, positive for others to follow. Um, and we were in a hot category. Everyone knew it was a hot category. Um, and then just as importantly, we built a team internally that people were comfortable with. And I mean by that, Rick Wetzel had done Wetzel's before. I had built many brands. Our uh, VP of Ops had worked um, for 17 years in the industry. And so franchisees want to look at the concept and um, the people who are running the concept. And we basically got two check marks from those two boxes and then it went quickly. No problem. Uh, hey, Jim. Uh, you obviously had a very strong track record before joining Blaze. How did the founders of Blaze kind of entice you to join their team? Wow. Great insights. And I'm going to give you the my answer. Look, um, I've never believed growth and um, uh, a startup is about money. Um, maybe that's my biggest weakness because I never took a big salary, but they enticed me or I pushed on. I wanted equity, right? And one of the lessons I learned very early in life is you're not going to get rich working for someone else. You're only going to get rich if you can or and you want to make it positive, you know, a real difference in the world um, and create wealth if you have a piece of the pie. Right, and I think you uh, obviously you're all in the entrepreneurs group. You want to you want to create something that ultimately creates value, and um, so uh, they enticed me with equity, right? Which is what I was looking for. Uh, I, I had equity with Noah's Bagels and with Jamba Juice. They both made it, either being sold or Jamba went public, and that was really important to me. All right, um, and it's one of the lessons I've taught my children as well. We all have to start in the job, no doubt about it. But at some point, you know, that's the beauty of Silicon Valley and some of the startups today. <clears throat> today, everyone gets equity in the company and, and that gets everybody working together. Um, and I re really think that's the name of the game. It's really, uh, I, I'm disappointed. I'll just say this about Bezos, right? He's got so much money and all those employees ought to have a piece of the, <clears throat> of the company in some way, shape or form. Yeah, actually, just to follow up from that, like out of curiosity, do they reach out to you by email? Did they know you beforehand or how did that happen? I'm very, I'm very blessed that the, um, the head of real estate and the head of uh, development were both people I had worked with earlier in my career. Uh, and um, I was thinking of leaving and they basically, I called one, they, one of them called me just to say they were over at Blaze. It's a true story, two restaurants that were open. And um, so one of them said to the other, hey, I just got off the phone with Mises. Uh, he said to say hello. And she turned around to him and said, oh, my God, Jim was the best boss I ever had. And he said out loud, he was the best boss I ever had, too. And the CEO and, and co-founder, Rick Wetzel, said, who is that guy? We need to talk to him. And literally five minutes after I got off the phone, he called me up and said, what the heck are you doing? These guys think you're pretty good. Will you come on down and see me? That's how it went. That's crazy. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. That's a great story, Jim. Uh, Benjamin. Uh, thank you, Jim, for coming in. I, this slide, like the original slide, I think that was very useful. Um, I was wondering what advice do you have for pursuing like a professional development during and coming out of college? So just for our age group, uh, just yeah. kind of developing ourselves a little bit more in the future. Um, so... If I could give you one piece of advice as it relates to that, is find a mentor, all right? And I'm not talking about a mentor necessarily in the company you go to work for. It might be, it might be your father's good friend or your mother's good friend. It might be somebody who left uh, Cal Poly a couple years before you, right? And and they've start and they've at least got a head start with you. It might be someone, a teacher you had in high school. Um, but I will tell you, my greatest growth came from. 
I was lucky enough to have people who really cared about me. And I don't know why they did, but they did. And um, I'm lucky enough that some of those early folks are still in my life today. You know, I'm 65 and they're 80. All right. Um, but they still are my mentors. And um, when I look at the impact that mentors had on me and have had on so many others, um, and I look, for instance, in the restaurant business, there's something called Glean, which is trying to identify mentor mentors like me to help mentees like young folks like you um, who are two, three years into a job. I think that's the, one of the greatest growth uh, vehicles you can have um, because you're going to get you're going to get growth from your work. Um, obviously, having a, a supervisor who is interested in your development is critical. Never work for somebody who wants to take the credit for the work you do. As soon as you see that, get the heck out of there so fast. Right. But um, I think having a boss's boss, the other thing I've always said is, you know, who makes the decision about growth for a, uh, uh, someone in an organization is really the boss's boss. So a, a supervisor who gives you um, credit and who gives you exposure to his or her boss is someone you want to work with, right? Because they're going to have an influence on you, much like I, I use the analogy, much like your grandparents have an influence on you, right? If you have a good, if you're close with your grandparents, they really can influence your life as much, if not more so than your family. So um, that would be my, my greatest piece to you is... Um, outside development with someone who has an interest in you, who knows you, who can, who can tell it like it is and is there only to help you and not to judge you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, David. Awesome. Hey, thanks for talking to us, Jim. Really, really great uh, presentation. It's great to talk with you. Uh, my question is how do you inspire other people who are potentially working beneath you or with you? to work inside their zone of genius. So if you're in a leadership position and you have someone who's reporting to you and you think that they might not be working in their most desirable location, but they don't know what that is yet, what are some techniques that you've used in your career to help them and empower them and inspire them to find that for themselves within the company? Yeah, well, it's basically a lot of those questions I shared on that slide, right? Which is, talk to me about your greatest day so far in your life, right? What were you doing? And why was that so meaningful to you, right? And by the way, um, I've had people just say, as an example, they loved they they loved working on puzzles, and so well that well that's not anything that related to business, but it is because they love solving problems, right? So while talking about that they love puzzles, what they really were sharing is they're problem solvers, all right? And so we got to get them into that kind of an arrangement, all right? Um, and they didn't know that about themselves. It's amazing to hear some of the stories. Um, but I ask those questions all the time because once you can figure out what you were doing and why that is so meaningful to you and why time disappeared, then you've got to try and bring that into what is, the, what is the world you're in today. And you may not be able to get there in the next week or two or month in terms of the job, but I can begin to, as a, as a good supervisor, give you opportunities to develop more of that and demonstrate your skill, your zone of genius in that. And again, um, it's really a learning for someone to understand what they truly enjoy, all right? Versus again, zone of competence, which we all have to have. Does that help? It does, yeah, thank you. Sophie, you're up. Hi, Jim, thanks so much um, for, com for coming out today. I really um, like your advice on that you don't like, you don't have to know what your career path is right now, um, but, Having gone to Dartmouth and UCLA, um, when you decided to transition into the Westmont industry, um, tell us a little bit more about that. And like, did you ever second guess it? Did you look back? Um, kind of what made that such a great decision like down the road? Yeah. Um, so uh, one, there was a little bit of fear of, a, of someone telling me, you know, you don't want to be a 40 year old uh, director or VP of financial planning. All right. So that was uh, shaking in your boots a little bit. Um, but the re reality was I'm a hands-on person and I knew that about myself in my early 20s and that I, I actually liked retail. Um, I grew up in retail. My father was a pharmacist, um, but my father encouraged me to you know, pursue finance and, and accounting because mm. I, had, I had an affinity for numbers. But what I didn't realize is how much I love working with people and it really was this guy who said, Jim, you, you work so well with the operating folks. Why don't you become one? 
And I, I remember saying, well, I don't know. I don't know how to run a restaurant. And I'll never forget. He said, well, we'll teach you. And I went, bingo. If someone will invest in me like that, um, I'm willing to give it a shot. I know I can work with people. I don't mind working hard. I was a little hesitant about <laughs> Um, working at a Denny's and, you know, they're open 24 hours a day and I'm not a night owl. I wasn't even a night owl at the age of, uh, of 22. Right. Um, and so the idea of working the graveyard shift was, was scary as could be. Right. And I pulled a couple of the, all, those all nighters um, and said, I don't ever want to do that again. <laughs> uh, but what I realized is my job as the, as the general manager was not to be the one who did it all but to develop others. And but then when I realized, oh, it's just like playing, you're on a football team, you got to help other, you got to help others be successful. In football, it was by creating an opening for the running back or, or time for the quarterback to throw. In restaurants, it was making sure everyone understood their role and how they could do it and make sure they had the tools to do so. And that's where the light bulb clicked was, oh, my job as a leader is to make sure the folks I work with have the tools to be successful. Ah, and that's really what was the key then to how I ultimately landed is, is to being that first follower and building, scaling a company quickly. It's understanding what are the tools, systems, training, um, culture that's needed to help someone be successful when you're growing so fast. And then we built them and the way we went. So that was really the key. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah. Cool. We got, Jim, we got three more questions for you and... Uh, looks like you got 10 more minutes. I'd like to give you a minute or two at the very least before your next meeting. Yeah. So we could do these kind of quicker. Um, Kaylin, do you want to unmute? Sure. Just with the, the mindset and sort of the things you've been talking about, it sort of lends yourself to this ability of being able to jump to companies and make kind of maximum impact. Sort of how do you um, kind of take something and accelerate it and, you know, create the most positive change. So I'm curious, can you share some of your strategies of when you're starting your own company or when you jump into a new you know, company that you might work for, how do you go and really be very impactful from the start? Sure. Um, well, uh, two things. I think it's a, it's a, it's a um, simultaneous approach. One is I didn't start anything. So I'll just tell you what I did with, when working with founders. I wanted to get inside their head and understand why they, why they created this brand and what was their vision, all right? Then I went into the stores and worked with the people in the restaurants to understand how much of that had already been translated, either through the training materials, um, informal communication, uh, formal communication, what, were the, what was the culture and the values, had that been communicated and found the gaps and then quickly said, how do we plug them? So as an example, uh, at Blaze, they, they had a vision, but it wasn't documented, all right? So we had to go and create um, the mission and the purpose and our shared values and guiding principles. And then we had to, everything as, as typical in a, in a startup, everything was what I call tribal learning. It was all passed down from one person to the next and not documented. Well, that's great if you're going to build one new store a year, but if you're going to build 40 to 100 a year, you better have a training process and have everything from the culture of the company um, highlighted and communicated in a fun, meaningful way, and then have the training that is fun and meaningful as well. So we went off, off, as soon as we understood what that was, you have to go put those into place. So I would say the tools to success are really to understand the vision and, and articulate the vision and guiding principles, et cetera, and mission of the company, and then putting into place the practice, the procedures, the um, training, the incentive programs, everything that aligns so that people understand when they do this behavior, it's rewarded and it moves you down the line. And if you do a different behavior and it's not in alignment, it's not rewarded and there are consequences. Um, everybody likes guardrails, what we call them. Everybody wants to understand where the guardrails are and where the safety nets are with respect to performance. And you have to be able to make sure you, you deliver on that. Uh, hi, Jim. Uh, I was just wondering how important you think it is to be a part of an organization and get leadership and management experience before trying to run your own company, or do you think it's possible to be successful in running a new business without that experience? Um, well, I'd say I think it is possible. I think you, if you're going to try and run something yourself in the very beginning, you better bring someone on like me or a first follower, a fast follower who can help you 
bring your vision to life, all right, versus um, trying to do it all yourself. And again, I come back to jobs and, and everybody had a, a number two who was more of the implementer and the doer while the great founder was the visionary. Um, but there's also nothing wrong with going to work for someone uh, or an organization, understanding how organizations work and understanding a little bit more about yourself and your strengths and weaknesses. Um, and then really fully understanding that you don't want to work for someone you want to work, you want to lead something and going to do that. So I really think it's about who you are and where you are in your own development. Gotcha. Thank you. you bet. Quick fire round, two more. All right. Uh, yeah, Jim, you mentioned that the team started with like $5 million. Um, I was wondering like how much money was spent between the different um, areas like R&D, testing, marketing and things like that. Yeah. Well, I'll never forget, um, you know, my boss used to talk about um, $10,000 bills and this, you know, you, you only have so many $10,000 bills because you're going to run out of money. So spend them wisely. And so if you hired somebody like when I hired, um, you know, a CFO, well, that's a couple hundred thousand dollar a year job. That's 20, $10,000 bills. Boom. Right. And so you had to really understand what were the priorities. And so our priority was on building systems back to um, what we need to do to grow. Um, our priority was on recruiting franchisees. And our priority was on developing the brand and making sure the brand was distinctive. And so we spent most of our $10,000 bills or $100,000 bills, if you will, on those areas and then filled in as time went on. And it's, it's no different than, I say building a brand is like raising a child. Um, and I don't think any of you have any kids, but your parents raised you. And, you know, my analogy is, you know, when you're three years old, I don't teach you how to drive a car, right? I'm teaching you about numbers. And when you're seven years old, we're teaching you uh, um, about a little bit more than numbers. And 12, you're learning maybe some algebra and, and calculus if you're really smart. And when you're 16, you learn how to drive. And the whole goal is that you're now in college and pretty soon you're going to be out of college and you're going to be contributing adults. But I don't teach you at the age of three what I'm teaching you today. And it's no different in the development of a brand. When we were back at 10 restaurants, I couldn't be trying to emulate what Taco Bell was like with 4,000 restaurants, just not a wise thing to do. And by the way, that's the number one pitfall for people who come from a big company and go to a small company. They try and say, oh, well, at Taco Bell or at McDonald's, we did it this way. And they're with a brand that had 10 units. It's not going to work. Absolute failure. It just is. You can't teach a six-month-old to be potty trained. Not going to happen. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Jim, I want to I want to let you go after one more question that we always end on. Um, quickly, you're a wise guy. What advice would you give your college self? Um, You've talked about it, but if there was like one, one summary line or piece of advice, what, what would you think? Well, this won't surprise you, right? It's um, uh, follow your heart, follow your passions, all right? Be true to yourself and you can't go wrong. If you can work, if every day you go to work, you actually have joy, then you'll never work a day in your life. And um, I guess I was blessed enough to have, my father hated his work, by the way. Um, and he used to say that to me all the time. Um, and, you know, really, once I got into the role of working with founders, so we'll call it, once I got to 1994 and I started working in 1980, so it took me 14 years. But once I got to that, I would tell you from 1994 to the day I retired in 2019, I never worked a day in my life. Lucky me. There we go, everybody. You heard it from the man, Jim himself. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, super valuable. Uh, we appreciated your wise, wise thoughts and all your talking points. So if everybody could just thank Jim in the chat for being here with us today, we much appreciate it. Uh, we'll let you go now, but thank you so much for spending the time with all of us. Today. Hey, Elaine, I see somebody wanted my email. I'm happy to talk. If you guys, uh, if you'll share my email with everyone, um, they can get it that way. And Happy to always be a resource for, for you all if you have a, an easy, short question, things I can help with, okay? There we go. Thank right. you, Jim. Thank you so much. Have a, have a great rest of the year and summer and um, be well. Mm -hmm.